What's up, guys? My name is Mouton. I get to be the lead pastor of Relevant Church, and I'm so glad that you decided to tune in to one of our message replays. I believe that God has a word for you. Hey, listen, if you want to continue to support Relevant Church to be able to produce content that teaches the gospel and leads people to hope, go ahead and give a gift of any amount to giving.thisisrelevant.cc. You can sign up for recurring giving or give a one-time gift, but I want to let you know, every gift matters and allows us to take the gospel beyond our community, region, and world. So thanks for tuning in. Hopefully you are blessed by this message. Peace. I had a conversation with my father, with my dad, my dad, my father, the hero in my life, weeping and crying and saying, son, why would you put yourself in that situation? Son, there's a better way. Son, we've taught you better. And I remember looking at my dad with a stone cold face in my eyes, say, dad, you did well. You raised me correctly. You taught me right from wrong. You told me, you told me what was right, what was wrong. You've shown me and modeled good uh, leadership. You've modeled me, uh, modeled to me what a, a man is like, what is a father is like. You've done it right, Dad. It's me. I'm the one who wants to be out there doing what I want to do, and I want you just to let me be. Leave me alone, Dad. I'll figure it out. And it just got deeper and deeper. I don't know if anybody in this room can relate with that story. Where everything everybody tells you that you know is right, you know it, you know is right. For whatever reason, there is something inside of you that is so carnal, that is so rebellious, that is so angry, that you you choose to go against the very things that you know will make your life better and easier. You choose to position yourself in places of brokenness and hurt and entrapping yourself over and over again. Isn't that the crazy, the stupidity of sin that you know this is a bad idea, but you do it anyway, and then it entraps you, and then you're mad at, how did I get here? And then you go the next day, and you do the exact same thing again. I remember being so high one day, I was at the movies, and somebody had laced my weed. Sorry, I'm just being... I'm just being transparent. Somebody had laced my weed with angel dust. I was smoking before we went into this movie. And this movie I'm watching, I'm seeing like Animaniacs. Y'all remember the little boingy, 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 Animaniacs all throughout. And all of a sudden the room starts spinning. I'm looking like, and I remember praying in my depraved mind, God, take this feeling away from me and I promise I'll never smoke again. I may have been 16, 17. God, I promise. I worked that man alive at that time, Keanu. You knew me back then. I was a different guy. And I remember walking out the movie theater being the only one in a clear mind and a clear head. I could actually feel normal, and everybody else is still tweaking. And yet, the very promise that I prayed to God, I'll never do this again, that night I smoked again. So... I did a few things, right? Got into college. Started working. Got a great internship for a major multinational company down in Orlando, Florida. Moved down there as an intern, 20-year-old guy. Moved into an apartment with five other guys. The interesting thing is it sounds like a beginning of a joke, my roommates. So there was a black guy, four Mormons, and a gay Asian. (laughs) Seriously, it was like, are we on a sitcom? I would tell people, like, who who are your roommates? I'll tell you, you're lying. I'm like, for real, it's weird. How did you end up there? I have no clue. Well, as time would have it, I got into conflict with my roommates. No offense to 
the Mormon church because we're streaming live right now. But a few of the Mormon guys hated the Asian guy because he was gay so badly that they would just bash him and, and just demean him and talk bad about him all the time while yet promoting their religiosity and their perfection and how much better they were. And I hated that about people who considered themselves believers because I was hated by my friend's mom. No, I was hated by the church. And again, I'm seeing what's seen as the church hating someone else. He was on his own journey, but he wasn't allowed to have his journey. He just was condemned and told, belittled and told he would never be anything. And I felt myself in him. I could see myself being condemned like him. And so I moved out, and I got in a different apartment, and I moved in an apartment with five girls. <laughs> Shoot. I mean, I'm married. I, I, ain't that, I ain't that ugly. And these girls look good, too. And I was excited, man. 20-year-old Denver, 20-year-old dude. Okay, sorry, not Denver, not Denver. We're, we're the single guys. <laughs> Moved into an apartment with these fine, pretty young things. 20 years old, I could have a pick of my life. Come on, let's do this. And four of them were devout Christians. But they weren't weird. Because my idea of Christianity was weird, judgmental, hateful, condemning. They were kind, they were generous, they were gracious, they were loving. They didn't condemn me for partying. In fact, sometimes they would come to the club with me, but they wouldn't get drunk like me. Somebody, don't say that. Christians can't go to the club. They came to the parties, but they didn't get high. They didn't condemn me for sleeping around, but they just chose not to sleep around. And Sunday morning, they would invite me to church graciously. Hey, we tell you, you want to come to church this weekend? Nah, I'm good. Cool. All right, we're going to go to church. Afterwards, we're going to have a cookout and make sure you're there so we can all have fun together. They still accepted me. I saw Christianity in them that I'd never seen in my life, and they were young adults. These were 20, 21, 22-year-olds. And so God began a stirring in me and saying, what, what possibility could be? What would it look like if I lived like them? I ended up leaving my internship early, coming back home, because I came back home for a girl that I was dating at the time, and she broke my heart. 30 days later, she broke up with me. And which made me just spiral even more and more out of control. She doesn't want me. The world doesn't want me. Church doesn't want me. Well, I'm just going to live my life. I'm going to do my thing. Then I get sick. I get sick. Get really, 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 really sick. And I do what every smart young man does when he gets sick. He goes to his mama's house. And he moves in for the duration of his sickness. Because mama's always going to take care of you. Come on, forgot mama's in the front room. No matter how foolish, no matter how dumb, no matter how stupid you are, you come home, mama's like, come on. But come on, I love you. <laughs> and I got so bored one day, my parents were at church, and I was sitting home by myself. I didn't want to watch any more TV. I didn't want to do video games. And I went to my dad's room to see if I can find a video of a movie that I've never watched before that maybe I could watch it and it'll give me some sort of like just satisfaction and I'm just like, let me just go watch a movie and I can relax. And I found a CD. Y'all remember what those are? You know, if they're around, they go slip into a dryer. Grabbed a CD and it was a CD of a sermon. And I was like, man, I haven't done church in a very long time. The least thing I can do, my parents are at church, I might as well just listen to something faith-based right now. 
And this CD was part of a nine-sermon compilation. Can you believe that I listened to every single one of them back-to-back -back that day? I was so enthralled because this man was speaking like I speak. He was talking like I talk. He was telling me everything that was on my mind. He was telling me that God is for the sinner, that God wants to draw the sinner back home, that God loves us and will never condemn us when we come to him in Jesus Christ. And he, he's, he's not against us, but he is for us. He sent his only son to die for us, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And no matter how far you've gone you were, no matter how much bad you've done, no matter how bad you thought you were, that there was still a place for you in the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus. You're accepted too. And Muta, you can be loved too. And Muta, you can be redeemed too. And there's hope for you too. And I listened to all nine and I said, what in the world did I just listen to? He wasn't as eloquent as every other preacher out there. He just talked like a normal guy. So the next day I went and I found the Bible that my girlfriend had given me when I was 18 years old. Like, who the heck gives your boyfriend a Bible at 18? I was so mad, Dana. I mean, they could have bought me a pair of shoes. You could have bought me. You got me a Bible? I don't even do this religious thing. But God knew that at 21 years old that I would need to find that Bible. And I found that Bible in a drawer, dusty drawer. Opened it up to the book of Matthew. Don't know why I chose Matthew, but I began to just start reading it, just like a narrative, just like a story. I saw Jesus' baptism. I saw when he got to the crucifixion and I was weeping. This is just a day later. I was weeping uncontrollably. I didn't know why I was weeping. I don't know why my heart was so compelled for this man that I didn't yet know why my heart was so uh, just drawn to this guy that is in this book that I had put in a drawer. I couldn't understand why this man would go and be punished for things that he didn't do, why he would take on the world's pain and put it on his back. I couldn't understand why he would do this because all I could hear in my ears was the messages that I heard before. Jesus did it for you. He was broken, bruised, punished, ridiculed, stabbed just for you. He did this for you. The cross was for you because of your sins, because of your mess. He allowed himself to be crushed and suffered a sinner's fate, yet walking in holiness. When I got to the end, I just simply said one thing, God, if this is real, if this guy is real, I want to get to know him. If he can change my life, I want to get to know him. If he can put me on a narrow path, I, I want to get to know him. If he can accept me just the way I am, I want to get to know him. So by now, I'm 22. I'm dating my wife. In fact, we get married in March. And my church is doing baptism again once a year. And now I've got a decision to make because I've been going to this church quietly. We've been going quietly. We've just been sitting in the back because now I've mustered up enough energy to at least sit in there. I've actually met some people who went to college with who are, who, are, who are kind to me, who are generous to me, who've seen me in my mess, who were in their mess as well too, and they're there too now. And so we're both sitting there like, can you believe what God is doing in our lives? Can you believe where we were? Can you believe some of my drinking buddies, some of my smoking buddies, some of my people who we just did all types of mess with? We're sitting in church together looking at each other like, how in the world did we get here? We got our spouses. We're all married. Let me tell you, God will redeem your life in such a way that you have no clue. There is so much good waiting for you. It says, eye has not seen or ear has heard or mind has never thought of. 
what God has in store for those who love him. I'm sitting, and there's a call for baptism. But you know, it's cool now, like, I'm married, my life is seemingly on the narrow path, but then I see the water and I say, but I've done too wrong. I've done too many bad things. I know I'm cleaned up now, but y'all don't know what's really in my heart. You know how messed up I am. You don't know how bad I've been. You don't know how bad I am. Is there a place for me in this house? I get it. I'm here. I'm nice. It looks like a great facade, but can I really truly be in? Because sometimes we walk into church hoping to appease God not really believing that we're truly saved, not really believing that we're truly in, but saying, by showing up, maybe, maybe you'll see me, maybe you'll forgive me, maybe. So as I was thinking about being baptized, every reason in my mind was like, I shouldn't get baptized because this, and you did this, and you were with this person, you were over there, and you did this, and you, all of this list, a laundry list. And then, the religiosity, because that's what happens when you get saved and, or uh, start going to a religious church. I start saying, what will other people think if I get baptized right now? Because they see me now all cleaned up. Will they think I'm really messed up? Will they think there's something wrong with me? If I get baptized, all those people who've started to like me now, who enjoy being around me now, they're going to say, oh my gosh, look at that dirty, rotten sinner. Why would you get baptized? I thought you were better than that. I didn't know you were baptized yet. There was all this condemnation from religiosity. There was condemnation from sin. And I was saying, man, everything stands in the way of being, be being baptized. And it reminds me of a story. I'm going to go through it fast. It's in Luke. Nope, it's in Acts chapter 8. Verse 26. It's a story that many of you guys who grew up in church kind of probably familiar with this story. Some of you guys are going to be like, what the heck is going on here? But just track with me. Verse 26 in Acts chapter 8, it says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Philip is a believer. He's known as an evangelist. He's one of the apostles, one of the disciples, who is one who is called a deacon. So he's somebody in scripture. He says, go down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he arose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official, Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship. There's an Ethiopian eunuch who's in the court of Candace, the queen, who's come to Jerusalem to worship. Now, let me tell you, there's something majorly wrong with this situation. He is an Ethiopian. That means he's not a Jew, and he's going to the Jewish temple to worship. Bad idea. Because if a non-Jew was to enter a Jewish temple, he could be stoned, and his life would be on his hands because there was a big sign. If you are not part of the children of God, you can't come in. And how many of y'all know sometimes our churches our church is filled with people who say, everybody else out there, don't come in here. Everybody else who's doing bad over there, you're not welcome here. We're good here. We pull kids out of public education because we don't want them to be around those people. We don't want to be them to be taught by those people. But yet this Ethiopian who's not accepted in the house of God is so compelled about the love of God, about the mercy of God, that there's something about him that says, I will risk my life, I will risk death to just get close. See, here's the deal. He wasn't allowed to be in, but he sat outside. If you won't let me in, I'll just, I'll just stand by the exit door just so I can hear worship. Because I know that my life isn't where it's supposed to be, and I just want to be close to something that gives me hope. And he's a eunuch. Now, a eunuch was a castrated male. 
What would happen is if a king conquered a nation, they would enslave some of the people, some of the able-bodied men, and they'll make them uh, court guards or make them uh, serve the king and the queen. But because there was the uh, possibility of this man sleeping with the queen, what they would do is they would castrate them so that they could never defame or, or, or bring down the name of the king and the kingdom. And so they would literally take their man parts off. And listen to this. Listen to this. This is straight. This is Deuteronomy 23, 1 through 3. No one whose testicles are crushed or whose male organ is cut off shall enter the assembly of the Lord. So now he was not only ethnically different, he was socially and physically incapable of entering the assembly of the Lord. A lot stood in this man's way for him to get close to God. He was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. This man is reading, reading scripture. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join his chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked him, do you understand what you are reading? Listen to his response. Listen to the authenticity of his, uh, of his, uh, of his reality. He says this, how can I unless someone guides me? I don't even know what I'm reading. I just know when I pick up this book, it just gives me some sort of joy. It gives me some sort of peace. But I don't even get what the heck it's talking about. Who is this talking about? What is this? Now, the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, talking about Jesus, and like a lamb before its shears is silent, he, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliations, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation for his life was taken away from the earth? Talking about Jesus' sacrifice for you and I, how he was humiliated for you and I. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom I ask, does this prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? And then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus Christ. There's good news with Jesus. There's good news for the brokenhearted. There's good news for the lost. There's good news for the sinners. There's good news. There's good news for you and me. But here's, there's always a dun, dun, dun. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? See, here's water. What prevents you from being baptized? We come up with all of these reasons of why it's not the right time. Just had a conversation with somebody after first service who said, man, I want to be baptized. I believe that God has called me to be baptized, but I just feel like it's not the right time because there's things inside of me that needs to clean up. There's things that I need to change. There's things. Let me tell you. I asked him, I said, do you love Jesus? Do you believe in Jesus, your Lord and Savior? Do you believe that he, he bled and died for your sins? Do you believe that he was born of a virgin? Do you believe that he's the second part of the Trinity, the God-man, God of God, kings of kings, Lord of lords? Do you believe he's the Messiah who came and went to the cross, died, went into the grave, rose again, has returned back to heaven, and is returning back for you at the right time? He said, yes. I said, then what stands in your way? Because the devil and religiosity work for the same team. Did he just say that? Devil and religiosity work for the same team because both of them say, you're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not holy enough. You got to clean yourself up before you'll ever be accepted by God. But God says, for I loved you so much that I sent my son to die to take the punishment that you were due. I stood in the gap for you so nothing can stand in your way. You can walk right into that water and restart your life anew, afresh, redeemed, forgiven, accepted, loved. So what stands in your way? Two thousand and five. 
December, I was baptized. Something incredible happens at baptism. There's nothing holy about the water. But there's definitely something holy about the moment. It is a moment that you can never take back or forget in your life. And I'm not talking about being sprinkled on your head as a baby. You forget that. I don't see anywhere in Scripture where it talks about sprinkling water on anybody's head. Every baptism I see in Scripture is full immersion. You're dying to yourself. You're going into the watery grave, and you're coming up, accepted by the Lord, forgiven, redeemed. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives through me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live in Jesus Christ, the one who died for me because he loved me. There's something that incredible that happens at baptism. You can never, especially as a believer, you see, when we get baptized as little kids, it's easy to forget that because we really didn't know what we didn't know. But when you're baptized, when you're making your own decision, when it ain't about impressing the pastor, when it's not about impressing your parents, when it's not about impressing anybody else, you just realize, I was dead, and now I can be alive in Jesus Christ. I want to give my life to him. What stands in your way? <laughs> See, the Ethiopian eunuch, racial segregation stood in the way. Body manipulation stood in his way. Distance stood in, his, in the way. But when he heard the good news of Jesus Christ, Philip must have told him, Jesus stands in the gap. He's the bridge. Yes, 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 your sin puts you far from God. Yes, yes, your rebellion puts you in enmity with God. Yes, yes, all the things that you've done draws you away from God. But in Jesus Christ, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So though you were dead in sin, you could be made alive in Christ. So what stands in your way? I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. Now, that story was nice. Oh, look, 20, however years old, 2005, you got baptized. Look at you, you're a preacher. No, 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 no. Let me tell you about the realities about life, about faith that we don't usually teach. We have a real devil who hates us and who will not stop trying to come after you and trying to convince you that you're not good enough and that baptism didn't take and it didn't work and, and you're still messed up. So in 2009, don't get distracted by that. In 2009, all of a sudden these thoughts started to come into my head. These desires started coming to my head four years after my baptism. And before I knew it, I was headlong back in sin. Falling into the same pit like a dog returning to his vomit. Going right back down the muddy waters of sin and depravity. All the while telling me, the devil telling me, see, I told you you're not good enough. I told you you'd mess up again. I told you that baptism didn't take. I told you you're not good enough for God. I told you God doesn't really accept you. I told you you're stuck in sin. I told you there's no place for you in the kingdom. And for eight months, I lived in absolute depravity. getting worse and worse and worse by the time, by the days that went by. 
knowing that I wanted to follow God, but having such a desire to follow the world, knowing that I wanted to do good, but having this connection to evil, wanting to be the man that God has called me to be, but settling for the man that the world told me I could be. Until one day, I'm in my office, fetal position, crying out because I'd finally gotten to the end of my life. (laughs) By now, I'd been serving in church. I'd been seen as a leader in my church. I was in utter rebellion once again. I remember sitting in my office, underneath my office, saying, God, I messed up again. I understand if I'm fully disqualified. I understand if I could never be saved again. I understand that I carry the stain of sin. I understand that my brokenness is breaking my relationship with you. I understand if everything is just going to fall apart. But God in his gracious love reminded me of that day I went into that water and he sealed me not only in the precious blood of Jesus, but implanted the Holy Spirit in my heart. And he said, son, the simple fact that you are here calling out to me lets you know I've never left you. I never let you go. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. You're not chained up. You're holding on to the chains. Let him go and get started again. A righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up again. Let me tell you, baptism is a moment where you can say, God, I may fall again. I may stumble again. But God, I need you to know I want you. I want no one but you. Heal me. Redeem me. Remind me of this moment. What stands in your way? The worship team is going to sing a song. And the song simply says this, Oh God, oh God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. If you are in this room, And your heart's cry right now is, oh God, oh God, I need you because I'm stuck. I'm back in that situation. I'm back making those decisions. For some of you guys, you guys were baptized as adults. You you understood what you were doing. You were very clear. But like me, you decided to walk in rebellion. Can I tell you, Romans 8, 1, seal it, write a tattoo it on your body. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You may fall, but just get back up again. Nothing stands in the way of God's love for you. There is nothing, absolutely nothing that stands in the way of God's love for you. So just get back up again. For some of you guys, you got baptized as little babies, maybe sprinkled water on, didn't know what the heck you were doing. Maybe you were seven, eight years old, and you were just like, oh, yeah, I want to be, I want to follow Jesus. Had no clue the gravity and the weight of the decision that you were making. And you're saying, you know what, as an adult, as I hear the word, I know my journey, I know my story, and I need to fully make a commitment to walk in faith with Jesus Christ. If you are in this room, I want to invite you. Today, nothing stands in your way. If you're wondering what stands in your way, nothing. We got shorts, we got t-shirts, we got towels, and we got water. You can start your new life with Christ. And maybe you've never been baptized. And maybe you've just never been baptized. Maybe you've just never gone that route. 
And today you're saying, man, I got to make a decision to follow Jesus. Can I promise you this? It ain't going to be easy. Life ain't going to be Skittles and rainbows. But it'll be the greatest decision that you make because God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And he will be your strong tower. He will be your strength. He will be your guider. He will be your protector. He will be the lover of your soul. So number one, if you're in a rebellious state, and can I just tell you, come home. I just tell you, come home. I've been there. It ain't pretty. It just gets worse, especially after you've already said yes to Jesus. Listen, there's a scripture that I just read this week. It says, what happens is a person gets cleansed. The demonic activity, the demonic presence, Satan's influence that was there before leaves. And then the person gets cleaned up but doesn't bring the word of God in their hearts, it doesn't bring it in their life, does not fill themselves up with the presence of the Lord. It says it goes and gets seven more demons and comes right back. And the state that they're in after is worse than it was before. Now, I don't believe that you can be possessed if you're a believer. I believe you can be oppressed. I can believe that the devil's influence over your life can be so crazy that it can make you delusional. And some of you guys are in a delusional state, and today is the first day you're experiencing clarity. Right now is the first moment where you're hearing God say, listen, it does not have to be that way. Stop settling for less. Stop settling for the lie. I've got more for you. Trust me. And let me tell you, being on the other side of what I went through in, from the time I was 14 to 22, then in 2009 to when I am now, I am telling you, God is good. His mercies are new every morning. His faithfulness is everlasting. Your life will take on a trajectory like you've never, ever, 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 ever dreamed of. The good that God has for you is greater than the decent at most that you're experiencing now. But you have to make a decision. Come home. And if you want to be baptized, listen, they're about to sing a song. This is what I'm going to tell you to do. Slip out, go through the exit. Studio B has changing rooms. They've got towels. They've got T-shirts. You can start your life anew in Jesus Christ. You can walk in step with Jesus Christ. You have a family of faith here who are willing to walk the journey with you, walk alongside of you. So I'm going to pray. Would you allow God to do something in your heart? Would you just hear the spirit of the Lord speaking to you today? This, I, I think it's not by chance that everything happened with the music. God was like, I don't need none of that. Somebody in here needs to know I love you. I forgive you. I'm not mad at you. I'm mad about you. Those are God's words to you. God, I just pray for every individual in this room. Lord, who's wrestling with this decision of whether to get baptized or not. Wrestling on whether this is the right time, this is the right place, this is the right situation. All of the lies of religiosity and the enemy tries to tell them. God, all you want to say is well done, good and faithful servant. I see you, my son. I see you, my daughter. God, I pray that boldness will begin to rise up. Strength will begin to rise up. Hope will begin to rise up. They will know that there is more in Jesus. That their life doesn't have to be what is, but it could be what you would have it to be. Strengthen them in this moment. In the mighty name of Jesus.